Well, I know where I stand now, Dino. Excellencies, honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to our 2020 KFFPCI virtual dialogue titled Democracy in the Time of COVID-19, Challenges and Future Opportunities, proudly hosted by Korea Foundation and Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. My name is Cindy from FPCI and I will be your MC for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a global health crisis, but it has become a challenge for the current state of our democracy. Today's virtual dialogue aims to explore the challenges and opportunities surrounding both democratic systems of South Korea and Indonesia throughout this pandemic. So to kick off today's 2020 KFFPCI virtual dialogue, allow me to invite the president of Korea Foundation, Dr. Lee Gun, to deliver his opening remarks. Uh, dear distinguished guests, uh, friends from all over the world, uh, as president of the Korea Foundation, it is my privilege to welcome you all to the KFFPCI virtual dialogue. Uh, with us today is Ambassador Dino Pati Jalar, the president of the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. I appreciate you and your team's commitment and passion in bringing this virtual dialogue to fruition. I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to our distinguished speakers, His Excellency uh, Todu Mulya Lubis, Mr. Andy Bayuni, uh, Professor Leon Kim, and Professor John Delury for joining this dialogue to share their outstanding experience and vision, and Ambassador uh, Changbom Kim. It is such an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for taking valuable time out of your busy schedule. The Korea Foundation launched the Korea Foundation Virtual Dialogue Series to explore possibilities for our future as we witness and respond to the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, three dialogues have been already held so far in partnership with the Asia Society Switzerland Center, the Russian International Affairs Council, and the Harvard Belfer Center of the United States of America. Uh, today, our fourth dialogue is co-hosted with the FPCI on the topic of democracy in the time of COVID-19. Through this session, we hope to explore the nexus of the pandemic and democratic political systems. Distinguished speakers, dear colleagues and friends, it is being said that the COVID-19 crisis has created a threat to democracy. Many, na many nations have found their health care systems overwhelmed, as a result, they have had no choice but to engage in strong and controlling measures such as lockdowns. Uh, in nations where there is a low level of trust between civilians and the government, we have seen that these measures carry a risk of unrest and discrimination. The pandemic also requires us to consider issues related to personal information and human rights. These concerns have cropped up in, even in nations that have responded in democrat democratic ways, for instance, in Korea. All in all, COVID-19 has created delicate circumstances. They offer a chance for politicians inclined to authoritarianism to exploit the pandemic to overturn democratic systems. Friends and colleagues, today's dialogue has been designed to generate productive discussions and exchanges on democracy and COVID-19. I hope you will learn valuable lessons from our two nations' experiences. On behalf of the Korea Foundation, I would like to once again express my sincere gratitude to the FPCI for co-organizing this dialogue and to all our invited experts and guests for coming together here and now. Through diverse discussions by these uh, renowned experts, I'm certain that we will gain the insight and direction needed to turn these current challenges to democracy into future opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee Gun. I now invite the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Patijalal, for his welcoming remarks. Uh, thank you very much, and it's good to see uh, our friends, uh, uh, President of Korea Foundation, Dr. Lee Gun. Uh, Chang Bon Kim, my good friend, ambassador of uh, ROK to Indonesia, uh, and all the other, the other speakers, of course, my, my good friend, uh, Todung Mulya Lubis, uh, very famous uh, human rights lawyer in Indonesia since Suharto days, um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Yu Yang Kim, 
John Deluri, and of course, uh, Andy Bayuni, uh, the famous journalist from uh, Jakarta Post. Uh, you know, democracy was already uh, under duress uh, and possibly in retreat before COVID-19. Yeah, uh, we, we know this to be a popular uh, issue. Uh, and uh, now that COVID-19 uh, is here, the question is what happens uh, to democracy that was already uh, seemingly uh, in retreat before uh, the virus uh, arrived. Uh, definitely we are at war. Uh, this is World War III. Uh, the difference with World War II was World War II was about uh, to make the world safe for democracy. World War III, uh, the enemy is uh, very smart. Uh, it's a smart virus, uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Uh, but the, the aim of this World War III is to make the world safe from Corona, yeah, the whole world, uh, all peoples, all nations uh, of the world. But uh, it does raise question of how democracies will respond. Yeah? And definitely uh, uh, empirical evidence around the world showed that democracies are under stress as a result of uh, COVID from a variety of, of uh, ways, you know, from the unemployment that is uh, surging in Indonesia now, uh, it's about 5 million people, they say, uh, have left their job in the last, in the last two months alone, right? Uh, and there's a lot of uh, economic and, and, and social uh, pressures resulting from the COVID-19 in the past uh, two months uh, alone. I think all countries uh, realize that in order to beat COVID, they must take strong actions, strict and disciplinary measures. Uh, but for democracies, the question is, how do we make sure that uh, those disciplinary actions do not uh, get uh, taken at the expense of democratic uh, freedoms, right? Uh, so uh, I I'm glad that uh, Dr. Gun uh, Ligon uh, asked about, uh, mentioned about trust, uh, because this is definitely what is at stake now, uh, uh, how the population uh, will, be, will be able to maintain uh, uh, trust uh, in, in the political uh, leadership as they uh, strive to battle COVID-19. Uh, and this is, of course, dependent on delivery, uh, whether or not the government can deliver uh, uh, measures that can beat uh, COVID-19. But uh, I really just want to underline that uh, we will discuss uh, today the democratic re response to COVID-19. Uh, what we are seeing uh, around the world are two things. One is COVID-19 is producing a lot of uh, uh, political divisions. Uh, we are seeing this in the United States. Uh, we're seeing this in Serbia and other places. And in other places, uh, it's also producing more political consensus. I think we Seeing this in Indonesia, uh, there's a lot more political consensus than, than before. Uh, even they said the hardliners uh, uh, are now allying themselves with, with, with the moderates in the effort to find uh, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, let's discuss how democratic response to COVID-19 is, is progressing uh, in countries like South Korea, uh, in India, in France, and in Germany. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, positive attitudes towards uh, the, the government uh, response, the political leadership response to COVID-19. Uh, so let's take a look at how, uh, why this is so, and where are uh, areas where uh, democracy are still having uh, problems uh, in, in uh, resolving the COVID-19 challenge. Yeah. So I'll stop there. Again, thank you so much for Korea Foundation for uh, working with us uh, on uh, addressing this important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padino. I would now like to invite the Korean ambassador to Indonesia, His Excellency, Mr. Kim chang -bu. Thank you. Tuan-tuan uh, semuanya, there's uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished panelists and speakers, my good friends. And let me first of all uh, thank FPCI and Korea Foundation for co-organizing this uh, virtual dialogue on democracy in the time of uh, COVID-19. Let me also express my deepest appreciation to distinguished panelists for joining us today from Seoul, Korea, and from Oslo, Norway. The discussion of democracy in the midst of unprecedented public health crisis is highly relevant and timely. Why? Because the COVID-19 pandemic is unfolding at a time when democracy is under greater challenge across the globe. The spread of the coronavirus disease is not only changing how 
we lead our lives, but also how governments and policymakers and political leaders are making decisions at the local, national, and global level. At the same time, the effectiveness of the response to the COVID-19 crisis depends on the level of coordination and collaboration amongst the different actors involved. It also depends on the active participation of the people on the street and civil society, such as observation of quarantine measures and direct involvements in voluntary, voluntary services. In this respect, Korea's case of handling COVID-19 needs a special attention and kindles resumed and renewed interest in democratic governance. While effectively flattening the transmission curve, Korea has chosen as a key baseline for approaches, fundamental principles of democracy. That is openness, transparency, and respect for democracy. Just uh, in the recent nationwide general election on April 15, with rigorous preventive measures in place, almost 29 million Korean voters went to the ballots. And as a result, we had an even higher voter turnout than usual without any single infection case. Well, uh, as for Indonesia, I think there's uh, one small uh, suggestion that I would like to make for our Indonesian friends. Uh, Indonesia has its own valuable platform to create a progressive democratic institutions in the Asia Pacific, that is Bali Democracy Forum. I think that's, uh, it's quite a uh, high time for Bali Democracy Forum to initiate an open online process to discuss how we uphold democratic values and institutions and how to cope with so-called post COVID-19 era in our uh, kind of the common pursuit of democratic values. I think that uh, today's discussion will hopefully will shed a new light on how we can keep fostering democratic values and architectures during and after COVID-19 pandemic. I look forward to a lively and constructive discussions this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us begin today's KFFTCI virtual dialogue by inviting our, moderate, our moderator for today's event, founder of FPCI, Dr. Gino Patigala. Thank you very much. Uh, we can now proceed uh, to the first pr presentation, uh, which is by uh, Professor uh, Ul Young Kim, who is a professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations, Seoul National University. Uh, professor, the microphone is yours. Ambassador. All right, let me take a look at my, okay, this is my uh, presentation. The title is South Korean Experience and Civil Society Perspective. Uh, so I'm going to share with you uh, South Korean experience, and then I would like to draw your attention to the role of civil society or um, citizens. Uh, these days, we talk a lot about uh, civic awareness and voluntary cooperation of citizens. Uh, and uh, South Korea is an exemplary case, and that is uh, uh, what I'm going to discuss today. Okay, um, well, how South Korea flattened the curve. As you, you, you can see, the figure shows that, uh, well, South Korea flattened the curve of new infections and have been able to contain and drastically reduce the spread of the virus, at least so far. Right? Um, and it has done so. It, it is widely known uh, by now, but uh, uh, we have done so without China's 
draconian restrictions on speech and movement or economically damaging lockdowns like those in Europe and the United States. So here's the question. So how did we do it? Right. Everybody nowadays, we are all aware that the basic strategy was to test, trace, and treat. Right. We aggressively, aggress, uh, aggressively test. Uh, you know, aggressive testing and contact tracing, and then um, effective treatment. Uh, these are three uh, success factors. This is basic strategy, and it worked so far. And in the process, the South Korean government uh, relatively did a good job. Uh, Ambassador uh, mentioned about the last, Ambassador Kim mentioned about the last general elections. Um, the ruling party uh, had a major uh, victory, uh, was all, almost overwhelming victory, and it shows that the government was uh, uh, better rated by the general public, and it's largely, it has to do with, uh, you know, uh, the, the successful basic strategies to test, to trace, and treat. But now, uh, but I'm going to draw your attention to the role of civil society. It was also critical and it was critical in terms of high level of civic awareness and voluntary cooperation. Right? Now, uh, in light of the role of civil society and a democracy, uh, many, uh, you know, uh, argue that South Korea shows that democracies can succeed against the coronavirus. And, well, again, Yuval Harari uh, wrote an interesting newspaper article, and he, there he compared a totalitarian surveillance model with citizen empowerment model. And uh, in short, a Chinese model is uh, based on totalitarian surveillance, and South Korea and other Asian models uh, are based on uh, citizen empowerment. So the, here's the, his basic uh, argument. In order to stop the epidemic, uh, people need to comply with certain guidelines, whether uh, they are washing hands, uh, wearing masks, uh, you know, social distancing, and so on. And there are two main ways of achieving this. One method is for the government to monitor people and punish those who break the rules. That's a total, totalitarian surveys, surveillance model uh, in short. But it is not the only way to make people comply with those guidelines. He goes on, Yuval Harari goes on, when people are told the scientific facts and people trust public authorities to tell them these facts, citizens can do the right thing even without a big brother watching over their shoulders. And here comes an interesting uh, part. A self-motivated and well-informed population is usually far more powerful and effective than a policed, ignorant population. So he uh, argues that you know, a democratic model based on citizen empowerment can be more effective than a totalitarian surveillance model and the role of the citizens and their trust uh, you know, is a, 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 is a central part of the model. And I show you some of the comments made by South Korean diplomats. Uh, first of all, uh, foreign, our foreign minister, Kang kyung uh in her interview with BBC, uh, you know, told that our basic principle, democratic principle, is openness, transparency, and fully keeping, keeping the public informed. And that's the way we've won the public trust and support. And here's the important part, being faithful to the very values of our, uh, values of our very vibrant democracy. That is the, uh, the important principle here. Uh, and then uh, Vice Foreign Minister uh, goes on, uh, this type of openness and transparency led to a high level of civic awareness and voluntary cooperation that strengthens our collective effort to overcome this public health emergency. And very recently, Ambassador Park uh, uh, go again uh, reiterates uh, what's been uh, uh, told by uh, you know, 
other uh, diplomats. And he, she particularly emphasized the role of civic, importance of civic awareness. People in Korea were willing to compromise their privacy to some extent for the sake of greater good, for the sake of public health. And I think that is civic awareness. So Yuval Harari presents a general argument and uh, Korean high-level diplomats testify uh, the importance of uh, uh, you know, an instrumentality of uh, uh, democracy and uh, civic awareness and voluntary cooperation of citizens. So that's South Korean study and I recently found this analysis uh, of IDA, which is Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. And the title of the analysis is Resilience to the Pandemic Not Only Depends on Enforcement Capacity. And this graph shows that uh, there's a negative correlation between uh, civil society participation and deaths in percentage of confirmed infections. Uh, and you see uh, South Korea down there uh, in the right side of the, uh, the graph. And Norway, we see Norway and other countries, democratic countries. So there's a, uh, this is a consistent correlation uh, between, uh, negative uh, correlation between civil society participation and uh, fatality, fatal, fatality rate. And uh, the, the analysis goes on. Um, the basic message is that uh, the engagement of citizens, uh, civic engagement, uh, and involvement of civic so civil society in public policy making are associated with better performance on a crucial indicator of public health, right? And there are many, uh, you know, um, hypothetical uh, causal mechanisms working here. One of them is that citizens experiencing that their voice matters in the public sphere. So engaging citizens experiencing uh, political efficacy are likely to trust more in government and therefore they behave responsibly. responsibly. And it uh, gives us a general uh, background information on this relationship between uh, civil society and uh, 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 you know, uh, um, the, the, the model. All right. And uh, here's a next question that I want to, to raise and uh, we can discuss. So we did relatively uh, okay at least, uh, but the, the Korean model, is it culturally bound? In other words, is it because Koreans are less individualistic, more community oriented and more willing to sacrifice for the greater good, right? Uh, some even uh, argue that uh, the lingering cultural imprint of Confucianism gives a paternalistic state a free, freer hand to intrude in people's lives during an emergency. So this is a culturally bound, if not culturally deterministic, argument about South Korean success story. Uh, well, I want to share uh, with you this slide. Uh, the title is Culture Matters. Yes, Culture Matters. Uh, but in more delicate and complex ways. This is a result of recent web-based survey conducted by KBS and it shows relationship between political culture and compliance with preventive measures against COVID-19. So uh, there are five political cultures identified here. So authoritarian culture, compliant culture, collectivist culture, democratic citizenship, and horizontal individualistic political culture are those five ideal types. So among Korean people, in short, some are authoritarian, some are compliant uh, and collectivist, but others uh, have democratic citizenship in nature and their political culture is more horizontal and individualistic. What this graph shows is that uh, no, there's no statistically significant uh, 
relationship between authoritarian, compliant, and collectivist cultures and uh, compliance with preventive <laughs> measures. Uh, on the other hand, people with democratic citizenship and horizontal individualist uh, you know, political culture, they comply uh, more and better uh, with preventive measures against COVID-19. Uh, well, by uh, democratic citizenship, there are, I mean, there are seven measures there. I don't have time to go over those seven measures. But the point here is that uh, the success is not because of Confucian culture uh, based on authoritarian, compliant, and collectivist uh, you know, political culture, uh, rather it has to do with democratic citizenship and horizontal individualist uh, political cultures. So uh, culture matters, but it does not directly have to do with Confucianism. It is a more delicate and uh, a complex, uh, you know, relationship. So uh, my final, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, thing that we want to discuss uh, is then um, is the Korean model transferable? It's not culturally bound or culturally determinist, but culture matters. Then um, can we just transfer Korean model to other parts of the world? Uh, can you just implant the Korean model on a different soil? Well, uh, we need to discuss and uh, we need to study more, but uh, well, again, from Yuval Hari, there's an interesting argument. Uh, let me just uh, you know read here. Normally, trust that has been eroded for years cannot be built overnight, right? So it's culturally, culture matters. It takes time. Uh, it, it only gradually changes, but these are not normal times. In a moment of crisis, minds too can change quickly. And here's the really interesting uh, you know, analogy. You can have bitter arguments with your siblings for years, but when some emergency occurs, you suddenly discover a hidden reservoir of trust and amity, and you rush to help one another. So his point is that this can happen in a moment of crisis like now. So instead of uh, building a surveillance regime, uh, it is not too late to, to, to rebuild people's trust in science, in public authorities, and in the media. Right, let me wrap up. So I'm going to show you South Korean experience based on uh, democracy and uh, uh, civic engagement model. It worked. Uh, it has to do with our culture. It's not culturally bound, but South Korean culture matters, uh, about which I can show you more pictures, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll think I have to stop here. And we can discuss, and we would like to dis discuss more about whether it is possible to transfer the Korean model or utilize the Korean model uh, uh, or not. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim, for that very enlightening uh, uh, presentation and I particularly like the last point that uh, a trust actually can be built a lot faster than, than we uh, we moved to uh, ambassador Todung Mulya Lubis uh, who is Indonesia's ambassador to the kingdom of Norway and the Republic of Ireland to give uh, his uh, thoughts yeah uh, ambassador the microphone is yours Republic of Iceland oh. Iceland, sorry, Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ambassadors Dino Patijalo and Korean Foundation for inviting me to participate in this webinar or virtual dialogues. We have been given a very challenging topic, which is not only timely, but profoundly important for our society. Pandemic COVID-19 is something unprecedented, and we are now in an uncharted territory. Of course, I'm not saying there's never been any pandemic before. We, have, we had a Spanish flu. But pandemic COVID-19 has its own magnitudes unimagined before. The tension between public health and economic 
crisis. So how to deal with that? Now we all know, we all know that we are, we are living in interconnected society. Many nations have become very dependent on one another. We face no problems when Americans, when Germany yeah, had to rely on China under the global supply chain framework. But pandemic COVID-19 has stopped that. There have been so many manufacturing companies in Germany stopped producing because they don't have the supply from, from the other countries. Now we have that luxuries until the COVID-19, but we all know very well that no one single country can live together without working together with other countries. So the COVID-19 has turned down the world upside down and everything has been impacted. The way we live, the way we interact has been changed. Every aspect of our lives that is triggering economic consequences and refilling political vulnerabilities. So this is where we are at the moment. And the challenge is how to deal with that. You see, the COVID-19 pandemic crashed the global economy in just 100 days. Global supply chains scrambled, affected economic crisis around the globe. Economic growth in every country is declining. And of course, you know, I'm not saying there's no uh, producing uh, countries uh, making their own uh, products, they do, but they probably limit themselves to meet their own domestic demands. So what we are witnessing at the moment is a global emergency that is changing the way we live and how political leaders making decisions at the local, national, and global level. Now, this is the, the crucial point. The fear of losing grip in economy and in a challenging situation of dissatisfying public trust. Many governments have taken shortcuts in handling the pandemic. So whether it is in a form of national emergency lockdown and others, yeah? But that can easily be misused or abused to accumulate power and to silence political dissent and opposition. So the questions in the meantime, have we become authoritarian or should we become? For me, the answer is resounding no. We all know that democracy is massive. It has, it has always been massive. You have to comply with all the rules. You have to comply with all the regulations. And uh, the virtue of democracy is that lies simply that it puts the interest of the governing, of the, of the governments above the governing bodies. However, in democracy, we strive to balance the freedom and liberty. Now, are we succeeded in striving the balance between freedom, order, and liberty? Because we are now competing against time. Now, competing against time force us to do the shortcuts. Now, in doing the shortcuts, because we cannot afford to lose and to make mistakes. But we make mistakes, we keep, we keep making mistakes. And the country like Indonesia and other developing countries we don't have good social safety net. Their problem in dealing with this kind of pandemic. To manage the threats is not an easy one. Yeah? And I know that Indonesian, for instance, has declared civil emergency but whether the way in which they declare civil emergency is in accordance with the legal requirement or constitutional requirements is something that needs to be answered. Because I don't think presidents should be given all the authority 
to declare the emergency without approval from the parliament. Our constitution has stipulated very clearly that emergency has to be approved by the parliament. But whether it has been complied with, whether it has been done in such a way, I think Andy Bayuni might be able to answer that. Yeah. Uh, I still have a question about that. Uh, let me go to the next slide, please. Let me talk about human rights a little. The COVID-19 pandemic is a public health emergency, but it is far more than that. It is an economic crisis, it is a social crisis, and a human crisis that is fast becoming very complicated. We have seen now how virus does not discriminate, but the impacts do. Exposing deep weaknesses in the delivery of public services and structural inequalities that impede the access to them. We must make sure they are properly addressed in that response. We see disproportionate effects on certain communities. The rise of hate speech, disinformation, targeting of vulnerable groups, and the risk of heavy-handed security response under mining health response. We must ensure that any emergency measures, including states of emergency, are legal, proportionate, necessary, and non-discriminatory. So this is this is the the main challenge for us. Government must regulate it with correct measurements by protecting rights of which some of it are still non-derogable. There are some non-derogable human rights which cannot be negated under any circumstances, even under emergency situations. But the virus threatens everyone. Human rights should uplift everyone. By respecting human rights in this time of crisis, we'll build more effective and inclusive solution for the emergency and the recovery for tomorrow. Of course, this is not easy. It is easy said than done. Certainly temptations is there. Ruler in some countries, I'm not naming any countries, could not resist the temptations. Accumulating powers, even wealth, in the name of fighting against COVID-19. Yes, this is wrong. History will tell that we fail our people. And we don't want that, for sure. So, where are we now? Let me come to my last uh, PowerPoint. I think I would uh, probably would like to stress to underline the fact that freedom of expression and information is very important. This is crucial for the functioning of the truly democratic society and continue to be so in time of crisis like this. However, all special attention should be paid to the communications and dissemination of information relating to the virus and its circulations, risk of the contaminations, number of fatalities, as well as measures which have more remote connection with the policy of social distancing and others. It is undeniable that fake news related to the crisis and pandemic are spreading massively. To respond to this, we are all in this together. So it is not only government's jobs, individuals, civil society, I like the presentation from our uh, South Korean uh, professors, we all are in the same boat. We have to work together, and together we can stop, stop the fake news and disinformation. 
At the same time, the governments must be transparent, responsive, and accountable. The governments still have to be able to deliver the message in good public communications. And I believe there is no basis, none whatsoever, none whatsoever, none whatsoever for censoring or blocking. The tendency to block or to censor is there, and the divisiveness of the society cannot be cured if we keep doing censoring and blocking and threatening. So as a closing, uh, Pat Dino, let me underline once again the need to have a strong press freedom. We know the press has been undermined by social media, by fake news, by disinformation campaign. But I believe at the end of the day, common sense will prevail. What happened in U.S. is a very good example where all this misinformation and disinformation prevail. But I believe common, common sense will prevail and freedom of the press, I'm talking about mainstream media actually, freedom of the press, especially with the mainstream media, will properly function as an objective watchdog to all of us, to all abuses and systemic fake news that's been spread out. This is what we are facing now, and I believe if we can work together, the civil society, the business sectors, the governments, as well as the international community, we should be able to deal with all this crisis be it public health or economic crisis. It may take time. I don't believe we can do much in 2020 or 2021. But after 2020, yeah, there is a sign of hope yeah, that we can recover yeah, slowly, gradually. I guess I should stop here, Padino. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Todung Mulia Lubis for that very uh, clear presentation and for reinforcing the message that democracies don't need to step back and compromise in order to beat COVID-19. Uh, very uh, strong message there and I move on to the next speaker which is uh, um, Professor John Deluri who is the Chair of International Cooperation Program of Chinese Studies at Yonsei University. Uh, Professor John Deluri, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to the Korea Foundation, to old friends at the Korea Foundation and, and new friends at FPCI for including me in this dialogue. Um, I'm really honored, a little bit humbled. This is quite a group, um, and uh, I, I, um, I maybe earned my short spot here with a piece that I wrote for the New York Times um, about the election in South Korea, um, and that was for me, the tip of the iceberg of a lot of thinking we've all, I like all of you, uh, have been doing about this question of democracy in the time of uh, pandemic. And so I'm very happy to, to contribute and engage in the dialogue. I had um, sort of two inconvenient truths, uh, one tricky puzzle, and then end with one tragic observation um, to, uh, as, as grist for our mill. So the inconvenient truth, this is to echo something that we've all been saying, I think we all agree, but we have to remind ourselves where we were before COVID-19, that uh, we talk about waves of democracy and we always like to think about a new wave, uh, but the nature of waves is they come in and then they go back out. And we were in a historical moment of retreat uh, of democracies, of democratization, but also within democracies, uh, a retreat of the, the sort of liberal um, elements within many democracies. And if we think about the elements in that retreat, um, a few that come to my mind that I would highlight, again, picking up on comments, one is the inability to address structural inequality as a global phenomenon. Uh, and liberal democracies were, were failing, and I think we have to 
uh, wrestle with that. Um, you know, if we think about what do you remember before Corona, uh, I remember the Oscars and Parasite and the joy in Korea. Um, my son asked me this morning, is Parasite, is that literally a parasite? Or uh, in the movie, was there really a bug in the movie? And I tried to explain, no, it's a metaphor. Um, but it's very important that we remember the, the of course, there's a great moment for Korean culture, but it was, it was because the issue of inequality is something that the whole world is struggling with. And that movie is about our collective failure. And, and that falls on liberal democracies um, to address that. And, and then the second one would be climate change. We were failing to address climate change. Um, so another pre-corona memory for me is Greta Thunberg, the Swedish activist, uh, and the movement that she was leading of Friday strikes and these extraordinary gatherings that became unimaginable because of social distancing. Uh, but the problem is still there and um, is only really more, more dire. So next to inequality would be uh, climate change. And, you know, because of those, because of other factors, the third aspect of the demo democratic retreat I would highlight was a kind of general uh, inability to channel the forces of nationalism into the liberal <coughs> cosmopolitan democratic culture that these countries like Korea, Indonesia, my native United States, uh, that we have always thought we represent. Um, and so that inability to bring nationalism in, nationalism is a permanent feature of the modern world, but the liberal democracies were not able to harness it. And so the energy of nationalism was moving many publics in uh, an authoritarian direction. So that's the first inconvenient truth. The second one is, and we could debate this, but in my own assessment, liberal democracies have not done better than whatever we want to call them, non-liberal democracies in the pandemic. Um, we have highlighted, and I completely agree, and it was very well done, the, the presentation by Professor Kim about South Korea as a model of how a liberal democracy has responded very effectively and, and, and very much in keeping with a democratic spirit. And I can think of other cases. Prominent cases would be Taiwan, uh, uh, Germany probably, Japan in a different way, uh, Australia and New Zealand might be another one. All of these, and there are others that's uh, just, just illustrative, these are liberal democracies that have not gone against their nature as liberal democracies, and, but have successfully so far combated uh, COVID-19. But there are catastrophic failures in, uh, among the liberal democracies. And of course, the United States is at the top of the list. United Kingdom is right up there at the top. Um, uh, Italy is not far behind, and we could debate it, and, and maybe Ambassador wants to comment uh, with the Nordic place. I know it's controversial, I have many Nordic friends, uh, but um, Sweden arguably uh, is, is not a great model of a liberal democracy uh, managing the pandemic. And then also I would say there are plenty of non-liberal democracies that have been successful, and I think it's important we acknowledge that. Um, I was with my family in Vietnam for a while uh, in January and February and have continued to uh, monitor Vietnam. And Vietnam has an extraordinary record. It, you know, Vietnam would not describe itself as a liberal democracy, um, but they've done incredibly well for various reasons in uh, combating the pandemic. And that's just one example. So I think we need to factor that in. Um, now, the third point kind of builds off this is to say, to ask a, a puzzle, and I do not have the answer to this, and I'd be very curious if other panelists have insights here. Um, why have some liberal democracies uh, succeeded and others failed? I think that's an important question for us to all wrestle with, to ask, and, and within our different approaches, what is working and what is not. One observation is if you look at these, at these clusters of groups, Younger democracies seem to be doing better than older democracies. Post-1945 democracies or post-1989 democracies uh, seem to be doing better. So is there a reason for that? Can we think of why uh, younger democracies are handling the pandemic better than older ones? I think also as a, as a gross generalization, Asian democracies or democracies in the Asia Pacific are doing better if you look at 
uh, just the epidemiological numbers, the mortality numbers, are doing better than Euro-American democracies. So why is that the case? And can we get some insight uh, in, from, from dividing the democracies in that way? One element maybe of the answer to that question, something I've been thinking a lot about as an American, but I've lived in South Korea for 10 years now and, and been experiencing uh, the pandemic, of course, very closely in touch with friends and family back in the United States, but living here with my family and friends in South Korea. One thing that's really highlighted for me is the whole notion of the public. And in a way, this is a little different than democracy. You know, it reminds me of my old college days studying theory and the idea of democracy versus the idea of republicanism. And what does republicanism mean? Res publica, the public thing. That the public thing, the public goods, uh, as, as, as one of the panelists mentioned, you know, the common good, that that's uh, why um, our governments exist. Uh, and it's also the duty of our citizens to attend to that public good. And I look at the effective response here in South Korea, and what I see is public health, you know, the sustained investment in public health um, that's paying off, the way in which the political leadership, starting with President Moon, defers to the public health experts. Um, and so the expertise is respected in public health. I think public education matters. The quality of public schools, the average public school in South Korea is far, far better than the average public school in most parts of the United States. And so when we talk about fake news, when we talk about distrust of expertise, um, that's part of why there are such different reactions <laughs> in South Korea than in the United States is public uh, education. And then the last one uh, that again, I've thought a lot about is public information. You know, in the United States there, and, and I, I think we see this in European countries as well, there is this visceral response against privacy violations and concerns that basic public health work and contact tracing will violate uh, privacy. Um, why is that playing out differently in South Korea? I think part of it is that there is a sense of public information. And when people, when South Koreans are... Um, uh, in accordance with laws that have been passed to deal precisely with crises like this, when South Koreans, you know, no one likes it, but everyone is putting up with, for a temporary period of time, divulging more information than they would like to. Why? Because that information is going into the public infrastructure. It's going to the public health agencies, and they are putting it right back out into the public. So we get the information on apps on our phones to know about uh, risks, to know about the course of the uh, of the disease within our own neighborhoods. That notion of a public information environment is much stronger, in my observation, in South Korea than in the United States, where there's very little public information to begin with. And so any notion of sharing your information feels like a privacy uh, violation. So that leads me to my last um, kind of point here and, and uh, category of uh, that, that, by the way, was all the puzzle, the tricky puzzle. You know what, I'm not trying, I'm proposing hypotheses, not um, answers to these questions, but I think it's very import important that we ask why are some liberal democracies doing better than others? What are the elements of that success so that we can, we can share those best practices? My last point, my tragic observation, and on a day like today, um, it, it's really with a heavy heart, uh, but we have to look at what's going on in the United States and think about the implications of that in the, in the immediate, in the mid, and the long term. Because this is where we could really be, you know, at one of these hinge points of, of history, um, depending on the future course uh, of the United States. Right now, the United States is, uh, is the sick man of the democracies. And I use that fully aware of the controversies around um, that phrase. The United States is, as a, as a government, but also as a society, um, is being torn apart by this pandemic. Uh, and even good things that are happening are likely to exacerbate um, the, the negative impact of the disease itself and trigger Lord knows how many waves um, in the United States. And, you know, I think for the whole world, and especially for countries like South Korea and maybe Indonesia, 
um, who, you know, have traditionally, with plenty of critical viewpoints, but at a certain level, looked up to the United States, modeled themselves, uh, constitutionally even, on the United States. It, it, further back in history, received aid from the United States, you know, and that's, that's part of the legacy, at least of South Korea and many countries. This is where there's something, there's a shift in history because countries like South Korea and Indonesia cannot continue to look up to the United States. Um, the, the view of the United States has to be one of thinking, how can we help the United States rather than how can the United States help us? And I give a very practical example, and it's part of why I wrote that piece for the New York Times. Um, the South Korean National Election Commission is actively working with the states, secretaries of states, because the November election in the United States will be uh, organized at the state level. There is an active assistance basically happening uh, by South Korea to uh, share their knowledge and their experiences with this incredibly successful national election that was referenced here in April so that U.S. states can benefit from that and try to replicate elements of that. That's what I mean by a new way of looking at the United States because traditionally you would expect U.S. leadership to be providing that, if not to Korea and Indonesia to other parts of the world. And now uh, the United States is in help. And just to close, you know, if we think about, first of all, the Americans I know, we all have uh, deep, deep anxieties about whether the November election will occur, will occur with legitimacy uh, in the view of the public as a whole. Uh, so that is, and when we talk about crises to democracy, that is the next one to have on everyone's radar, is that something goes terribly wrong uh, in November, and it is basically an illegitimate election. Even if it's a legitimate election, if Trump wins, half of the country enters a despair that is tinged with rage of the kind that we're seeing on the streets now. If Joe Biden wins, I would say at least a third of the country maybe temporarily retreats into deep hostility. And in many cases, they are armed with handguns. Um, and so, and we were watching them the week before protest. So these are some of the deeply disconcerting trends that we all need to watch vigilantly in you know, what used to be the beacon uh, of liberal democracy for the world. And now is, is a country very much in need of, of help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that very uh, thought-provoking uh, comments. Uh, your comment that uh, the United States is a sick man of uh, the democracies, uh, I find it very interesting. Uh, if I were to say that, uh, everybody would jump on me, but if it's being yeah. said by American, I'm sure uh, it's a different story. I can get away with it. <laughs> you can get away with it. And, and the other thing is, uh, you know, your point that uh, Indonesia is looking more to other countries than, than the U.S. is, is quite uh, happening now. Because now uh, Indonesia is looking a lot at, at Korea, for example, you know, in terms of lessons learned, in terms of uh, getting equipment and, and uh, you know, the spirit of partnership and, and, and so on. So, so I think, I, think uh, I cannot argue with that point. Uh, now I will go to the next uh, speaker uh, before we go to question and answer, which is, uh, uh, Mr. Andy Bayuni, who is a top uh, journalist at uh, uh, Jakarta Post, uh, he was the chief editor and now he has stepped aside uh, as chairman of the board. And he is also the uh, member of Facebook Oversight uh, Board, which means I'm going to have to talk to him after this session, you know, <laughs> to complain about uh, there were like five people uh, faking my Facebook. Um, faces for the <laughs> so, uh, uh, but anyway, you need a, uh, the, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Dino, and thank you to the Korean Foundation and to the uh, FC Foreign Policy Community in Indonesia for putting together this very great uh, discussion uh, and very important topic. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of this discussion. I hope I can contribute something. Uh, I titled my presentation, as you can see on the screen, is How Resilience is Indonesia's Democracy. 
uh, because with the COVID-19, I think all democracies are going through uh, severe tests, whether are we going to survive as a democracy once this virus is uh, uh, overcome, or are we going to move towards an authoritarianism? Uh, and some countries uh, around the world are already moving in that direction. So I'll try to answer that question. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, to give the, the give the 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 the, the pre uh, COVID nineteen uh, uh, landscape in Indonesia, we, Indonesia is a democracy. Uh, our democracy is a work in progress. Uh, we had the election in twenty nineteen. Uh, it was the fifth free and fair elections in post authoritarian Suharto, and it sort of reaffirmed our status, our claim as the world's third largest democracy. What is as interesting out of that election is the voters turnout of 80%. I think that was incredible, uh, something that people uh, fail to appreciate. And I think this is actually a test to the uh, faith that people in Indonesia have in, on democracy. You may say the democracy is in retreat or regress, uh, re, uh, on, on a regression, uh, setbacks, but I think it's the fact that the majority of Indonesians, 80% of them still have faith in democracy, have faith that their votes actually are relevant, uh, shows that in, among Indonesians, they still believe uh, that democracy is the way forward and the way to solve many of the problems in our country. I just want to underline that the constitution that we have in place today guarantees all kinds of freedoms and basic rights. Uh, but one thing that I want to underline is that free speech uh, is guaranteed, but it's not strengthened further by the rise of internet and social media. Basically, everybody in the, in the country has, has a voice. So democracy is, like I said, a work in progress. It's not perfect. We have challenges. I think inequality is one of the big challenges that we need to address. But it is a functioning democracy, a functioning democracy. And I, I, I have faith in democracy and that uh, it should be able to address all these problems without resorting to the authoritarian uh, system. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, President Jokowi, Joko Widodo is in his strongest position to lead. Uh, I can't think of any president in post Suharto in this kind of position. Uh, the president, after his re-election in April last year, uh, started to build coalitions, uh, consolidate his power. Now, six of the nine political parties in the House of Representatives are in the coalition government, uh, including four largest, uh, PDIP, Garindra, Golkar, and Nasdem. And the coalition government includes, or the cabinet of uh, President Jokowi, the second term uh, cabinet of President Jokowi, includes uh, Prabowo Subianto. Now, he is uh, Jokowi's rival in both 2014 and 2019 elections. Uh, but last year, uh, President Jokowi managed to convince uh, uh, Prabowo to join the coalition government. So together, uh, the four political, sorry, the six political parties in the coalition government, uh, they control 75% of the seats in the House of Representatives. This means that any, any legislative speech that uh, the president presents, it's almost guaranteed it will be endorsed. Of course, there will be some uh, negotiations, but I think most of the negotiations will be conducted within the coalition government rather than in the open uh, with, uh, in, in, through the House of Representatives. Uh, on top of that, I think the president uh, has also built alliances with many pressure groups, and this is very important. Of course, the business community has always been on his side, but the workers' unions, uh, through their membership or their affiliation with the PDIP, the largest party, is also very much on board with the president. Now, the Muslim conservatives, which had represented uh, 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 an incredible or the, the, probably the most powerful opposition to the president in the past, is now very much also on board. And also, I think uh, I have to add the millennials, uh, also well represented because uh, the president recruited nine uh, young pig figures representing the millennials in, uh, to advise him on how to approach the, uh, you know, this digital or this millennial uh, era. Uh, and just one more uh, 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 information. I think the president is very much in full control of the military and the police. I know this is probably taken for granted in most countries, but I think Indonesia is important because both the military and the police represent a powerful uh, uh, pressure group uh, that any president has to deal with. 
just to to reiterate the point, I think uh, in in February, after the completion of the first 100 days of the second term of President Jokowi, uh, many surveys show that his uh, approval ratings still range be between 60 and 70 percent. So he is a very very powerful president uh, going into this uh, pandemic uh, situation. There are some signs of uh, troubles in our democracy, a weakening democracy. I think the political alliances the president has built together uh, means that there is actually a very weak uh, opposition, uh, definitely in the House of Representatives. And this means uh, limited checks and balances. And I think this will have impact on how democracy is functioning in the country. Uh, there is also a disturbing uh, fact that the, 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 the democratic space is shrinking. Uh, uh, I'm talking, I'll, I'll explain this more a little bit later on, especially in, in the internet and the social media, which limits public discourse on policy making processes. Uh, the last one I want to make, and this is something that uh, I think I'm, we should be envious of uh, Korea, uh, where civil society played a vibrant, vibrant role during this pandemic. I think in, in Indonesia, civil society, once we were vibrant, but I think it's uh, losing influence and, and power. Uh, sorry, next slide. Sorry. Yes, okay. Um, so we have uh, this situation going into the pandemic with a very strong president, uh, which in a way is good because this means that he can make policies uh, on fighting the the virus swiftly. And he has done that. Uh, he signed the health emergency status back in January, uh, setting up the task force uh, on fighting COVID-19. It's led by the National Disaster Management Agency. Uh, however, for some reason, well, not her, he did not disclose uh, this uh, decree uh, until March. Uh, apparently he said that he did not disclose this because he did, want, did not want to set a public panic. Um, he raised the status uh, uh, from health emergency to national disaster in April. Again, this gives uh, the president a little bit more power uh, in particularly in deploying uh, resources uh, to deal with the COVID-19. But he actually backed off from the civil emergency status. There were discussions. In fact, uh, the president actually disclosed that he was con contemplating in uh, moving towards civil emergency if the situation got worse. But there were some pushbacks, uh, not just from outside the government, I think from, even from within the coalition, saying this is a bad idea. And I think uh, he, he backed off. Uh, he had the power to review the government spendings, uh, and he reallocated, he took out about 405 trillion rupiah, which is about uh, $27 billion. Uh, out of other programs, including his uh, development programs, uh, and then allocating them to specifically fighting the uh, COVID-19, including spending large sums of money on social safety net programs. Uh, he issued an executive order to allow the government uh, spending, uh, the government spending break the maximum 3% deficit. Uh, and then he just, uh, just last week, he issued another executive order to delay regional elections uh, planned for September to December. I think there's about more than 200 regional elections, uh, provinces and, and uh, districts uh, this year, but because of the COVID-19, this had to be postponed uh, until December. Uh, he was able to reject calls, very strong calls for quarantines because most other countries had already gone in that direction but he was able to reject uh, or uh, suspend that pressure, but he settled on large scale social restrictions. And then the timing and, and the extent of these restrictions are in the central government hands. I'm making this point because he was able to pass all these uh, policies with very little uh, opposition, uh, even there's some criticism, but I think not enough. Uh, and this is reflection that uh, you know, he is a powerful president he did not to have additional powers or authority uh, like in other countries uh, because he already has that power uh, even before the pandemic uh, began. Uh, next slide. Uh, just one point that I want to raise, uh, uh, one concerning uh, issue. 
is the return of active military in civilian affairs. This is very much noticeable uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the National Disaster Management Agency is led by uh, Lieutenant General Doni Monardo. Um, he is still an active military service. Uh, and then uh, with the outbreak uh, of the pandemic, uh, the military set up makeshift hospitals in Jakarta, on Pulau Galang in Riau, uh, to, to supplement the shortage in medical facilities to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, just last week, uh, he ordered the deployment of the military to help police in enforcing public discipline to observe the COVID-19 health protocols for the, the new normal situation when the social restriction status is removed. Now, there's nothing wrong with this because we are actually in a, an emergency situation. I think the deployment of the military is justified. But I think what is concerning uh, concern to many people in civil society, it, there is a pattern of the military returning to civilian affairs. Uh, and we saw this last year, uh, the president uh, decided to allow military to fill up civilian positions uh, without having to retire from active, ser active service, including uh, the appointment of uh, General Doni Monardo as to head the National Disaster Management Agency. And now he also heads the, uh, uh, the task force to fight COVID-19. Uh, but the, the, the problem, as I think what, what these people are concerned is that is this military return to civil affairs would uh, be uh, uh, withdrawn after the COVID-19 or is it going to stay? That's something that we have to wait and see. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned uh, the ability of the president to make uh, swift decisions, but they are not necessarily effective uh, to be, uh, you know, not, they are not necessarily effective. Uh, we have seen the absence of credible opposition means a little pushback to the various uh, policies that the president introduced. The House of Representatives uh, remains largely inactive throughout the pandemic, uh, but it was quick in endorsing government policies. I, I hate to use the word rubber stamping agency, but I think that it's becoming, increasingly becoming like that. Uh, there are strong, uh, signs of straining relations between the central government and the regional governments. Uh, because the regional governments wanted to move faster, uh, but I think the, the, the president, the central government, uh, was very much more cautious in moving uh, with, uh, with the massive testing, with the uh, declaration of uh, quarantine in the various places. So overall, I think there have been very limited public discourses on most of the COVID-19 policies. Uh, some discourses are going on in the internet and social media, but they have little impact on policy making. Now, there were early blunders we have to recognize uh, 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 by the government, like promoting tourism in February. This is at the time when most countries were already declaring uh, you know, the, the fight against COVID-19, but we were going in the other direction. And I think that was poorly advised. Uh, and there were also delays in ordering mass massive tests and imposing quarantines. Many of this could have been avoided or many of this could have been, could have been uh, introduced faster or earlier if there had been a healthy and vibrant public discourse on COVID-19, which we say, or which I think did not, almost did not exist. Next slide. Now, uh, uh, Professor John Deluri mentioned about, or I think, uh, yeah, you mentioned about fake news. Uh, uh, the earlier speakers also mentioned about uh, fake news. Of course, uh, with the uh, COVID-19, uh, we have seen the proliferation of fake news uh, uh, probably far more than in the past. But this is uh, understandable because I think COVID-19 is impacting everyone in big ways. Uh, so I think pe people just cannot get enough information. They will lap everything for every information that they want to they can get about COVID-19 because they want to know how they can cope. They want to see some, some hopes, but that they, you know, that there is a solution. Uh, and of course, the internet is never short of people putting out information. Some of them are accurate, uh, many of them are uh, inaccurate. So, but I can say this, uh, the fake news that we are seeing in Indonesia during COVID-19 is not as polarizing and as divisive as what we saw during the 2019 elections. So that's a good thing in a way. Uh, but uh, 
there are uh, independent institutions, some of them legacy from the 2019 elections, that were working to call out fake news, uh, and some of them work in collaboration with the social media platform. The government itself uh, is actively requesting uh, social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to take down uh, postings uh, that are considered to be uh, not just fakes, but I think dangerous. And I think most of the uh, these this, uh, social media companies are complying, not, not with all the requests, but I think the majority of, if there is a good reason for those posting to be removed, I think they will uh, remove that. Next slide. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, the government uh, COVID-19 information policy, I think this is very important for uh, any government to be able to succeed in getting the public, the people to, to be on board in fighting the COVID-19 together, because we keep hearing this message that we are in this together. Now, uh, the government controls the data on COVID-19 infection, infection rate, death rates, and recovery rates. Therefore, it still commands the most authority in spite of the virus of information, accurate or fake. So I think the majority of people in Indonesia still turn or go to the, the, the government to get the most reliable information. They, the government has a daily briefing, uh, updating us on the COVID-19 figures, but also making that opportunity to, to appeal to the public to observe the health protocols. Now, the infection figure reflects, the inf infection figures that uh, the government put uh, uh, announced every day actually reflects Indonesia's limited testing cap capability and not really so much on the real infection rate. Last week, Indonesia, uh, we were able to, well, the government was able to conduct, for the first time, 10,000 tests per day. Uh, but that still gives Indonesia about 1,100 people for every 1 million population. That is very low. I'm not sure about Korea, but Vietnam is like 3,000, 4,000. Malaysia is already 15,000 people per 1 million population. We are still a long way, but we have come a long way from just, you know, about 50 or uh, less than 100 per 1 million but it's still not there. This is in, in spite of President Widodo's instruction that uh, the, the, the team should increase the testing capability to 10,000 uh, people per day. I think it was just last weekend that for the first time, the government was able to do that. Um, there was no direct attempt uh, um, by the government to suppress dissenting voices, so that's good. Uh, but the deployment of buzzers and bullying uh, tactics and the using of doxing against critical voices, we are seeing this some. I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying that this is happening in a large scale, but it's, it, it's happening to some of uh, some people who are actually meaningful, that the you know, critical of the COVID policies. Uh, this is uh, stifling the healthy public discourses. Uh, just one point, because I'm a journalist, or reflect, just to reflect my bias. Since the COVID-19, we have, the government has done away with press conferences because, uh, you know, the keeping a distance uh, and all the protocols. Uh, so many of the press conferences are given online, uh, but many of these were just briefing. Uh, it became like a monologue. monologue. There was no opportunity for journalists to ask questions, to ask the tough questions that usually we had during press conferences. And this is actually, uh, detrimental to the government itself because since they, we did not have the opportunity to ask the questions, the journalists or the public which have questions in their mind would turn to others. And these others could be experts, but they, they could be instant experts who don't know what they're talking about, but they just want to have the popularity. We are seeing a lot of that with the, this, this proliferation of uh, fake news uh, in the internet. So just to conclude, uh, my last presentation, my last slide, uh, I would say that democracy in Indonesia remains alive throughout, throughout the pandemic, but it is, of course, not without challenges. The current political uh, landscape may be favorable to the need of a strong government to make the swift decisions, but I think the lack of healthy public discourse means there are limited check and balances to help the government move in the right direction. There were some pushbacks on the government well, so some pushbacks on the government are necessary to make, uh, for democracies to function effectively, including the point that I made about uh, ensuring that the military's activism in civilian affairs 
is limited to the current national disaster status. And once the, the status is lifted, I think we should uh, um, make sure that military goes back to the barrack. Uh, we don't want, we, and Indonesia, maybe like Korea, we've had uh, three decades of military rule. And I think that memory is still there for us. Uh, we don't want a return to that era. Uh, there is a need for a better policy and strategy in countering misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the use of bullying and doxing in the internet. Uh, the practice of that, I think, is, is disturbing. Uh, so there is a need to, uh, for the government, I think, for, to come up with a better policy dealing with these uh, problems, but without shrinking the public space for a, he a healthy discourse. I'll uh, end on that note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Papa Andy, for that pr presentation. I, I do want to tell you that uh, I think in February, uh, one of the boldest articles that I read was written by you. Remember, you wrote in Jakarta Post, uh, the title was, uh, Mr. President, you need uh, professional help. Uh, and you know my my heart almost stopped when I read that article. <laughs> but uh, but you know it was it was a very uh, when when, you, when I read it it was very constructive and and reasonable uh, uh, propositions and recommendations to the president at a time when a lot of people were just engaged in the politics of adulation you know which I thought was uh, very. Uh, uh, which put aside a lot of uh, good criticism that should be out there in terms of uh, our ability to fight COVID. So uh, let's get to the q and I want to take uh, three of uh, uh, several questions, but the first question will be from me. Uh, I, I want to connect uh, first what uh, Ambassador Todung said, uh, which is about uh, temptations, right? Uh, which is uh, democracies. Uh, the challenge is uh, the leaders have uh, temptations to take the shortcut uh, to go authoritarian ways. Yeah. So my question would be first uh, to to uh, the Korean professor, Professor Kim. Uh, in Korea, was there ever uh, any sign of temptations to make a shortcut or to go a little bit authoritarian by any of the advisors? Uh, uh, you know, I say this because. Uh, you know, usually there's always those kind of temptations, but was that zero temptation or was that still there, but the president uh, decided uh, to uh, go democracy? And, and for Pak Todung, uh, the same question. Uh, why do leaders give in to temptations uh, usually? Uh, is there an answer to that? Yeah. Uh, and to Pak pa, pa Andy, uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, uh, is uh, you know, a lot of the Indonesian media are politically owned. Yeah. Okay. You gotta post your independent, right? But I think <laughs> most of Indonesian, most of Indonesian media are politically owned by by a political master, right? Which means sometimes they're not as critical and independent as as they should be. Yeah. Do you think uh, this has become a factor in in our democratic ability uh, to fight uh, to fight COVID, right? Uh, and then the next question we have from Dave Stryker. Um, does population size have a great significance in choosing approach for handling the COVID situation? Does democracy better uh, for uh, less populated countries and authoritarian countries better for more pro populated uh, uh, countries? All right, so uh, anyone? anyone? Uh, another one is from Jared Sandler. Question for, for Professor John Deluri. Could you expand upon the underlying reasons why some liberal democracies like South Korea have combated COVID-19 better than other liberal democracies like the United States? Yeah. So those uh, four questions, yeah. Please. Professor Kim first, maybe? Yeah. Temptations. So was there Zero any temptation? Tem mm -hmm. okay. Was there any temptation of authoritarianism in South Korea? Um, I, I don't think so, but uh, I... Uh, just popped out of my head. I had one uh, episode that I want to share with you uh, at the very initial stage uh, from the very initial stage we've uh, conducted very aggressive and massive testing and sometime before the uh, general elections uh, some politicians advised that advised to slow down 
the speed of uh, you know testing so that uh, you know it uh, you know it does not uh, ill affect the prospect of uh, uh, winning in the upcoming election. But the, the president, the current government, uh, uh, did not take this politicized advice, but continued to conduct uh, aggressive and massive testing. So, yes, there, there's, there are temptations, uh, but uh, I think uh, political leadership matters. But more importantly, I would like to again emphasize the role of civil society or citizens. You know, they can play two roles. Uh, I call demand and supply roles. Uh, about the demand side, you know, uh, the, the Foreign Minister Kang kyung uh, stated that the Korean public is highly demanding. They want very effective government services. You know, a uh, vibrant civil society uh, that has a long history of uh, a democratic movement. Uh, we achieved democratization from below. Um, there was a, a very peaceful, uh, but at the same time, very powerful uh, candlelight vigils that uh, you know, changed the regime very recently. So the Korean public is dynamic and very demanding. And they know how to hold the government accountable. So, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this vibrant and dynamic civil society, uh, you know, uh, you cannot really fall. Uh, it's not easy to fall into this temptation of authoritarianism. On the supply side, supply side, you have a, a you know, sound policies and measures against uh, the COVID-19, and you need. Uh, the voluntary cooperation of the public, of citizens. Now, citizens with civic capacity, uh, civic awareness, uh, and uh, political efficacy can voluntarily cooperate with uh, government measures and policies. And they supply uh, these uh, voluntary corporations so that uh, you know, uh, government policy measures can be impl better implemented. So there's this demand and supply side, and I would argue that, uh, you know, why South Korean democracy succeeded against the COVID-19, I think it has to do with the civic capacity in terms of demand and supply. So, yeah, that's temptation. There's temptation of authoritarianism, but it didn't, it was not uh, very serious in our case, I would say. Thank you. Pat Odong, why do leaders, some leaders give in? Well, uh, well, of course, this is not only the case of Indonesia. But when we talk about Indonesia, I think I have to say that initially, they undermine the magnitudes of the pandemic problems. But it paralyzed the, the whole economy. A lot of people lost their jobs, millions of people. And the fact that we don't have social safety net, better like in other countries, that also tells something why the government seems to be ambiguity, uh, ambivalence, yeah, so to speak. We know very well that Indonesia economy has been doing very well in the last 15 years. Economic growth is over 5%, a little bit over. Yes, there's a divided society. There's a very uh, tense uh, relation between one block to another block. But all in all, I should say there's a solid support of, uh, of uh, political uh, grouping behind the powers, behind uh, President Jokowi at least. The whole reason the trade of Jokowi staying in power is to accelerate economic development. That's why Jokowi has been very active and to be fair, successful in building up infrastructures. But now it has to be stopped because all the budget has to be allocated to fight the pandemic. So uh, how to save that? This is a question of legacy. Legacy of someone who wants to be remembered 
as a president who succeed in developing the economy. But you cannot say both. Public health is matter, uh, important. This is matters. So if we, if we don't deal with public health, then we cannot recover our economy. So this kind of choices, yeah, this is kind of the dilemma faced by not only Indonesia, but other country. So the shortcut is taken to save the legacy. The shortcut is taken to recover the economy, to uh, probably restart the economy. But I think this is not yeah, realistic under this kind of circumstances. So that's why I would like to probably refer to John. John talked about illiberal democracy. Now, are we in a situation like that? Is Indonesian democracy is illiberal on the, or non-democratic democracy? I, I do believe that democracy is the best system, but it's not always the right recipe to deal with pandemic. You talk about Vietnam first. You talk about uh, other countries. But I like your idea, uh, your, your opinion, your observations, John. When you talk about younger democracy is better than the old democracy in handling this kind of situations. I thought Indonesia has a very strong collective uh, cultures, a very strong inclusive cultures. So does it matter? Does collectivity and inclusivity matters in younger democracy if you compare that with yeah uh, old democracy yeah uh, south korean speaker talk about civil society which is very vibrant in south korea yes we have also a civil society but less vibrant in our case a lot of or most of uh, civil society leaders have joined political parties have joined the companies the governments so this is a less vibrant society at the moment. But I'm not uh, really saying that I'm pessimistic about civil society. There will be a lot of people coming on, you know, come up, you know, due to the challenge. So uh, the, the civil society will, will become more uh, active again. That, that's okay. that's what my, my take. Thank you, thank you. But uh, John, do you want to ask the question, uh, answer the question uh, on why uh, liberal democracy of South Korea does better than the US? Yeah, well, I would um, I would echo some of the points. Also, Professor Kim's, um, you know, this issue of expectations. I think that's part of it. I think that at least um, in the United States, uh, there's there's a kind of complacency. Um, there's also I would go so far as to call it a tyranny of low expectations. You know, um, there's there's a kind of passivity, and I would say this among myself and my liberal um, friends, you know, very broad circle, that there's the whole reaction for a few years now has been kind of waiting for these institutions to kick in, you know, waiting for checks and balances to work as if it's some autonomous mechanism apart from uh, people, from civil society, from activism. And I do see a difference there with South Korea and maybe this resonates, I wouldn't dare to discuss Indonesian realities, but I do think in South Korea, the fact that democratization is a recent memory, the fact that the current occupant of the presidential office was a student leader activist, a democracy activist, um, you know, his generation, the parents of my students, they know very well the difference between, you know, they know the meaning of democracy in a way that I don't and my parents don't and my grandparents don't on the American side. You know, it's not part of that lived memory. And um, I, I think what's happening now is uh, in the United States is, is a, a real fear, again, looking toward November, uh, almost this kind of horrific, the deer in headlights saying, could we actually lose this? You know, and that may trigger responses that haven't kicked in. Uh, we're all epidemiologists now, so kind of antibodies that have not kicked in to the American body politic. But I think that those antibodies are stronger in younger democracies that know you have to fight for this. You know, you have to constantly get out there. You have to constantly hold the government accountable. You have to, I mean, the example I always use, and I'll end here is the issue of masks. The biggest political 
uh, uh, controversy so far that I've seen in South Korea was early on, there weren't enough masks. And there was no debate, do we need masks? Do masks really help? Uh, the South Korean public was quite unified in saying, we want masks and held the government accountable, where are masks? And the government essentially socialized production and distribution of masks and came up rapidly with a system to, uh, to make the supply uh, and, and, to, and to distribute it at a set cost. You know, and, and that helps. We don't know how much, but there's no question that masks help. You look at what's happening in the United States, literally masks are political symbols. And uh, there's not a expectation of the government to supply them. There's a, uh, a, a public, you know, kind of culture war over whether you wear a mask or not. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't answer the question, but it's maybe elements of, but these differences I, I think are quite profound um, between at least the way the oldest, you know, oldest written constitution, liberal democracy in the world is handling these challenges versus a very, uh, you know, relatively much younger democracy here in South Korea. Okay, by Andy. Uh, does the fact that many media in Indonesia is owned by political masters, that, that, does that uh, uh, reduce uh, our democratic uh, uh, capability to fight COVID-19? Well, not necessarily. I know the people who, the, the editors who run this uh, uh, media owned by business or political interests, and they're professional, and they're, tr uh, they're trying to do their best. Of course, they fight with the owners constantly. I know that for a fact. Uh, but they also know that uh, at the end of the day, they have to have credibility and, the, and credibility and trust is very hard to, to, to gain. So you have to build that credibility and trust from, from, the, from the audience. And you can only do that if you do practice good journalism. And I think during the COVID-19, this is a test. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see many of these big uh, media, in spite of the ownership, they are providing the space for critical voices. Uh, on, on, you know, on how to proceed with COVID-19. So I would say uh, it's actually, for this COVID-19, I think we are, we are doing okay. There were some problems last year during the, the election times because I think the media was kind of polarized uh, between supporting one or the other candidate. Okay, good. So uh, let me ask, uh, uh, there's one question uh, that uh, from Asep Setiawan, uh, based on experiences in Western democratic countries such as the United States, Italy, and United Kingdom, why do the government uh, seem powerless in encountering current pandemic given the high numbers of pandemic victims? Uh, and also, by the way, the, the earlier question was an answer whether or not countries with smaller population would do better in fighting uh, COVID-19 than countries with large populations. Yeah. So who wants to take up the, that question? Uh, the, the second one or the first one? Please, please, Bandy, go ahead. Uh, I'll take the first one. But why did is government uh, powerless in dealing with, in fighting COVID-19 in spite of lessons learned from other countries before? I think mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. That's something that we're also wondering. Uh, you know, we could have actually moved a lot faster uh, when the pandemic uh, began. Uh, again, going by the lessons learned from other countries. But I think. Uh, the way it was set up, I think in the political, I mentioned the political landscape uh, has prevented that. Uh, the, the lack of critical voices, the lack of uh, healthy public discourse, uh, to some extent prevents the government from, did not help the government in pushing, or did not put enough pressure on the government to push, uh, you know, to, to go for the more uh, re rapid reaction. I would not say uh, the government was powerless. I think it was the government was just slow in responding. Uh, eventually, of course, uh, I think the government got its act together. Uh, but you know, we could have moved a lot faster if there had been these uh, checks and balances and the critical voices that we need for you know for the government to be able to move forward. Well, okay. Uh, so I Please. can say something about Nordics, uh, Padino, yeah. because. Uh, Nordic is a small country, uh, small countries. Uh, Norway has only five and a half million people. So it is easy to handle. But aside from that, I should say that strong national leadership, very firm, is also 
something that has to be taken into consideration. Now, when they uh, have all this pandemic uh, started, the lockdown has been imposed, has been enforced in a very strict manner. So people obey that, people comply with that. And the testing has been very massive, yeah, for a country like, like, like Norway, except Sweden, I guess uh, Denmark, uh, Finland, and uh, Norway has been doing very well in this sense. Uh, that's why they managed to relax more, and now it seems that everything go back to normal in, in Oslo. You have restaurant open, you have public school open, you have uh, everything is open. And uh, of course, you have to keep social distancing. That's the answer. But the way they manage to get all the support from the public is the way they communicate with the society. This is what lacking, actually. This is what lacking in Indonesia. This is what lacking in US, except New York. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. <laughs> but I guess, you know, <laughs> but I guess uh, what has been done by Prime Minister Erna Solberg, for instance, when we dealt with this issue, he, she held a press conference, not with the media, but with the children. So she tried to communicate that with the children. So I, I was very touched with that, you know, approach. Yeah. And then after that, she held a uh, press briefing online with the reporters. But the first press conference she did was with the children when they closed the school. So I thought this is the way that probably, yeah, mobilized the support of the people and she succeeded. That, that's, can I, can I that. jump in? Can please, I jump please, in on that? Yeah, please, uh, yeah. Not, not, to not to correct the ambassador. Um, I haven't lived in New York in 10 years, uh, but, <laughs> but I, I agree with that analysis. Um, I, I think another, first of all, just on the United States, there is the whole issue of expertise, you know, and the way in which, I mean, it relates, uh, ND, to, as you would know, you know, the issue of, of the media environment, the toxicity of media, and also um, you know, frankly, conservative media in the United States literally using expert as a, as a pejorative. You know, I've been on Fox News a couple of times and they joke about, we'll make sure not to call you an expert because if we call you North Korea expert, no, none of our viewers will listen to you. You know, so they can't call someone an expert because <laughs> they've delegitimized that phrase. Well, that becomes a huge liability when you enter into, uh, into a pandemic where you need public health expertise. And so to this issue, the ambassador was mentioning, came up before about press conferences or not, what kind of press conferences, uh, you know, one of the most detrimental things in the United States was when President Trump took over the press conferences in le instead of letting um, uh, Dr. Fauci and the experts deal with the questions, he stepped in and hijacked it. Uh, and, and that set back the whole response further because it's a political response. Here in South Korea, President Moon doesn't get out there to talk about the pandemic. It's the KCDC director, Director Jung, you know, who's been the face of the effort. And so it's consistent messaging. It's based on expertise and information and an educated democratic public recognize this isn't the liberal approach or the conservative approach. This is what the expert advice uh, is, is telling us. Then the last thing, this is, I'll just quickly mention, it's too complicated, but if we compare the, the Europe and the United States, you know, another kind of inconvenient truth about this is the EU, where's, been, where's the EU been, right? What happened to Europe under the pandemic, even Nordic cooperation, uh, they, they all broke apart. I mean, basically, okay. Europe went back to its nation state um, uh, framework. And, you know, maybe that was good. You're, the EU does not have the capacity um, to manage this kind of crisis. Um, and what we're seeing in the United States is the problem of American federalism uh, with the kind of federal government and the leadership that we have now. And so states have been competing. We know all of these stories. You have a kind of chaos. You also have unconstrained travel. And so the virus keeps spreading from one hot spot to another. That's gonna happen this summer. All my friends in the United States are planning on taking little trips somewhere, uh, driving somewhere to a different state.
and it's just going to trigger another wave by the time we get to September. So that lack of uh, coordination at a national level, um, you know, the U.S. is is somewhere in between uh, the EU and the European nation states, uh, and that's been, I think, a real liability in in coordinating a response. Okay, good. We have come to the end of our conversation, but I do want to ask one one. Uh historical questions and not all of you have to answer it but anyone who want to uh, answer go ahead uh, but the question is this uh, there has been ideological competition obviously between democracies and non-democracies and by democracies that includes liberal democracies and you know other forms of, of, of democracies and there has been uh, certain uh, issues where the competition is fought, yeah. Uh, well, one obviously is uh, World War II, yeah. Uh, democracies rose up and fought and beat fascism, right? Um, the other issue was economic development. You know, there was a debate whether or not uh, democracies or non-democracies are better at uh, economic development. Uh, then uh, human rights is another issue. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the verdict is, is is clear on that one. I think democracies do better most of the time on, on human rights. Uh, and then uh, the more recent one is uh, terrorism, right? Uh, whether or not democracies or non-democracies uh, or authoritarianism are better at fighting terrorism. Uh, so the question is, 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, will the world look back and say COVID is one of the important historical Mind, milestone by which to say democracies did better than non-democracies non or the other way around in terms of beating a global issue. Yeah. So uh, anyone want to jump in on that? Will this be used as a historical milestone? Mm. Well, for me, this is a critical juncture in our history. Mm. So, uh, as I said earlier, there has been pandemic before, but this kind of pandemic, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has its own magnitude that has never been uh, seen, you know, in the past with all the economic impacts. So, uh, whether democracy is the answer to that, yeah? I don't believe that democracy is perfect uh, system or answer, but democracy at least yeah, can open up more door, more criticisms, more uh, balanced votes where people have their own share, their own, their own share and they can say something to like it or not like it or to criticize or not to criticize. But in other system, I don't think you have that door open for you. So uh, with all these uh, weaknesses or weakening democracy that we are witnessing at the moment, I still think this is perhaps the choice that we have. Mm. Okay. Good. All right. So now we got to, we have to, uh, I've been told that we have to end this session. I want to thank all our speakers uh, for their very uh, thought provoking uh, uh, and very. Uh, Ambassador Dijar, yes. uh, if, if I may, can I make a short announcement? Yes, please. Uh, please, first please. Of all, thank you very much uh, for organizing this uh, very meaningful uh, dialogue. I, I think we learned a lot. Uh, and also, uh, there was a very brief mention about Swedish model. Uh, I think it was mentioned by John. And uh, there are a lot of people who are very curious about what is happening in Sweden. Uh, the Swedish model is about gaining and achieving the so-called herd immunity uh, naturally. So uh, we organized another uh, virtual dialogue uh, on the 17th of June uh, together with Swedish Institute. and. Uh, there, uh, we can hear directly from the experts, the real experts in, in Sweden and also the real experts in, in Korea uh, about what is happening in Sweden and in Korea and compare the two models. So, so those who are interested in uh, the Swedish uh, models or curious about what is happening there, please tune in uh, to Korea Foundation YouTube on the 17th of June. That's my short announcement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ligon, and then FPCI will also uh, spread this news to our 100,000 um, uh, members in Indonesia. Hopefully, many of them will watch it. Uh, so thank you to all the speakers uh, for your time and for your very uh, enlightening and, and, and informed and intelligent uh, 
contributions to this discussion. And I'm sure uh, all our viewers uh, benefited uh, from listening to all of you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ligon, uh, President of Korea Foundation, for working with us and uh, on organizing this program. And thank you also for your friendship and, and support as always. Uh, I want to thank uh, my good friend, Ambassador Kim, uh, Chang Dong Kim, uh, for uh, always supporting FPCI and for, for, for speaking tonight. And um, I hear the bad news that you are leaving uh, Indonesia. Uh, that is really not good uh, for us. Uh, you know, you, you've done such a tremendous uh, job. And uh, hopefully uh, COVID-19 will last another two years, so you won't be able to leave uh, Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then finally, Director uh, of uh, Korea Foundation in Indonesia, uh, Bae Sung Won, uh, who is, uh, I think, on screen somewhere. Uh, thank you so much again for your uh, friendship and for your cooperation. Uh, thank you, everybody, and, and uh, please stay safe and healthy and send our best to your families and uh, to your colleagues and to your people back home. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Padrino. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.